seven. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off your orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our Facebook-only community, You'll gain entrance to our weekly and monthly prize giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we are going back into the kayaking world. Uh, the last time we saw these gentlemen, we were at the Conowinga, which is a really cool reservoir that I definitely wanted to explore a little bit more. It's, it's definitely, I, I actually think it is actually a hidden gym at this point. And we're traveling, well, 10 minutes downstream to the upper bay for the next event that was held actually on May 5th. Um, and we have the winner here, Dennis Campbell. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend, the one that makes it all work for the club. We have Jake Harshman. How are you guys doing today? I don't make nothing work. As he's looking out the window because the feds are there or something. <laughs> no, I don't I don't make nothing work. That's Aaron Fetterman. Uh, you, again, give yourself some credit. Nope. So, I mean, really to get this thing started here, um, you know, we're do, we're shooting this episode a little bit after the fact. Would this be considered like for Bassmasters, for Hobie, there's always this lull between like the southern and northern swing. Is this considered right now the lull in between the parts of the season? So <clears throat> the way we structured our schedule this year, it was very front loaded. Um, it was very, um, you know, heavy on the, on the tournament days early in the spring. And then we had planned on having like almost a, almost a month and a half period where there was no tournaments, but because we have the Juniata river makeup from April 6th, typically, yeah, well, I, I guess not typically, you know, previous years we'd had an event every month, but this year we kind of, we wanted to front load it that way we were hitting the fisheries at, you know, some of the absolute best times where some of the biggest fish would be susceptible to being caught. Um, because as you guys know, those big fish get really hard to catch in June, July, August, September, um, after they've seen 384,000 jackhammers, mm -hmm. you know, they, they get pretty gun shy. So we, we wanted to give the, uh, the membership the best opportunity to catch as many big fish as they possibly could. So that's why we kind of had like a real heavy front loaded schedule. Um, but, um, Conowingo really showed out and I think it's going to get itself a spot again next year. I think it seems that way with the, <clears throat> the, the leadership group votes, but, um, I mean, the Conowingo is a pretty special fishery, but, you know, we always have, we have three fisheries that are always going to end up in our rotation, the Potomac, the upper Chesapeake Bay, <clears throat> and somewhere on the Susquehanna River. The Conowingo is on the Susquehanna River, but it's certainly not like most of the rest of the Susquehanna River. So, um, well, what are the pros and cons when you double stack events like that going back to back? So I think the pros is that it's, it's way less travel time for the anglers. The cons is not every angler can make Saturday and Sunday. Um, but I think another pro is that as you get later in the season, into August, September, um, even somewhat into July during the summertime, when people are taking vacations or, you know, honestly, I mean, <laughs> in a tournament season, it's easy to run out of money. Um, so the later you get in the season, the more difficult it is to travel, the more difficult it is, um, you know, hell, even just scheduling Airbnbs in June, July, and August mm -hmm. can be difficult because everybody's trying to take vacations and then you have kids going back to school. So a lot of things happen. So I would consider it a pro as far as scheduling. And I think so far what we've seen is that the numbers 
from last year late in the season, like the August, September events were way low. Um, and even our Sunday events that weren't as well as, uh, you know, as well attended as our Saturday events are still far beyond what our, you know, September and early October events were last year. So I think we're on the trending upward turn, but we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll do a poll here coming up soon, probably after the summer and see what the membership feels and maybe, because we're going to be looking, well, we're already looking at next year's schedule. So I've always wondered this when it comes to scheduling, how important it is just to chase the numbers of like, well, you know, how many people get there? Because if you look at it from like a Bassmaster standpoint, if it was just numbers, they'd be at Gunnersville every weekend or like Fork and right. screw everybody else. Is there a balance of like, okay, I know you guys want to go to Susquehanna seven times in a row, but that doesn't make it a tournament schedule. So we, we do need some diversity. So I, I'll speak for myself and I won't speak for the leadership group. I would love to see us visit different fisheries every year. Um, and even if, even if we didn't do different fisheries, I would like to see us maybe go to the Potomac in the summer when the grass mats are up, um, where it's not as many community hole fishing type of scenarios. Um, same thing for the upper Bay, but giving our, our membership, I think the biggest focus is not necessarily chasing a number as far as attendees, but giving our membership the best chance at success. Um, and success is catching five fish, right? So when you're looking at that, it's typically a lot easier to catch five mm -hmm. in the tournament setting early in the spring than it is, you know, as you get into summer. And I think that's the biggest goal. It's a, a, a fun oriented, like is our membership having fun while still having the opportunity to take home a pretty nice size check? Right on, right on. And that really kind of gets us into this where, you know, you had the double, double dip matinee here with Conowingo and then, then the upper bay and, and Dennis, you know, I want to turn this over to you here. You had two events back to back. How did you practice for them? Did you just go all in on, on the upper bay or did you kind of like mix and match? How'd it go down? Uh, I had zero practice for this tournament. Um, but I have to, I have to add, um, I'm originally from Cecil County, so I, I have a good knowledge of the area, both on the Upper Bay, in that area. Um, Conowingo, um, I haven't fished Conowingo in probably 15, 18 years. Wow. Um, so that was the first time back. Um, I, 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 can't, I, I can't say that. I, there was one tournament I've had maybe three or four years ago. Um, I didn't do well. Um, and that's always been the story on the Conowingo for me. Um, I, it's a shame. It's, it's in my backyard or it was in my backyard. Um, I live in Delaware now. Um, I'm still not far from there. A lot closer than a lot of people had to travel there. Um, I just need to put some time in up there and figure it out. How far of a drive is it from Delaware? Uh, from my house, I'm actually on the, I'm actually on the Maryland Delaware line. Okay. So it's probably 45, 50 minutes um, to the Conowingo. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the Pennsylvania, Maryland line too, like on a border okay. line down below. So yeah. I get that. Yeah. Well, then really getting into it then, what was your conceptions going into that week and in that weekend? Um, I thought I was going to win them all. Uh, <laughs> right on. Uh, you, always go, you always go in hoping that. Um, I've I've done well before, not always, but I've done well before on the upper bay. Um, but let's we'll talk about the Conowingo first. Um, I I enjoy fishing that. I think it's a great fishery, um, and I agree with Jake. It's not the better part of the river. Um, there's probably better water and better fish down below. Um, if you get up in the rocks up in, up above the dam or the reservoir. Um, if you get up in those rocks, you know, that's where, and that's actually where this thing was won. That's where the bigger fish were, um, at least in my situation. I went the opposite way. Um, again, I had no practice. I just went in, went, went in blind, um, fished what I knew, fished some new water. Um, I, went, I tell you the truth, I, that day, I, I, um, I didn't go far from the ramp. I was probably... 
I fished a lot of wood. I planned on fishing wood in the morning because I figured there'd be bass in it. Um, there probably were bass in it, but I couldn't get around on a snakehead. Um, I found some monster snakehead and messed around two hours in that tournament um, trying to keep the snakehead off my off my lure. Um, and eventually I caught a 13-inch, and again, after two hours, I said, enough of this. I got to go find some fish. Um, and I did. I found 28 fish that day. Um, I went towards the dam, towards the deeper water. Um, not 28 fish, but they were all 12s, 13s, maybe a couple 14s. Um, I think I ended up with 116 in that in that tournament uh, hmm. out of 28 fish. Wow. And that was my day. Uh, I cast a lot of casting, um, but I always do that. And I cast all the way up to the last second, um, but it just, not, just wasn't meant to be. And then in less than 24 hours, you're going to be, you know, scooting down towards the, the bay. I mean, did you feel pretty confident with how you finished there? Because it's one thing when, I mean, I guess when you finish middle of the pack or a solid day versus like you just suck and then you got to turn around and do it again. Well, you, words well spoken. I, I felt like I sucked. <laughs> I felt like I um, didn't know how to fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know where, I didn't know how to find big fish. Um and I didn't have a lot of confidence going into Sunday. Um, I really didn't. But I had a plan, and I just stuck with it. And uh, I knew the weather was going to be bad, and it turned out, you know, that was the truth. Um, you know, we had some bad weather all day, and I figured I would fish and try to stay out of that weather as much as possible. I have a love-hate relationship with the Upper Bay because of college and stuff. I've been fortunate enough to qualify for national championships on the Bay, but I hate it too because of how it fishes and, and how it lays out. Uh, for people that don't know, think of like, it's like a Lake Okeechobee. It's a big fish bowl, which is what we consider like the flats. And then you have some, you know, close centric creeks you know, Northeast Swan, and then you have the, you know, the Susquehanna flats that you can get up into. And there's a bunch of other creeks of you, if you want to head down on a boat ride on the ocean that you could probably get to as well. Um, what generic area were you keying in on? Um, again, I, my plan was to stay out of the weather, uh, stay out of that wind as much as possible. Um, and find, I, actually, I, I planned on finding skinny water. I fished skinny water all day. Um, I was in water probably six inches in catching fish. Um, how much of a boat ride was it for you to, or boat ride, but how much of a kayak ride was it for you to get to those places from? Cause I'm assuming you have Northeast Javi to grace. i really don't know any other kayak ramps in that area. Shit. Susquehanna fly. There's one there by the bridge. So I think those are the only ones, right? There's there, some, there's some along Perryville. Um, oh, Perryville. Thank you. Yeah, it's <clears throat> Perryville. Um, there's a, there's a lot of actual ramp, like ramps that you're able to use under our rules. Um, some of the marinas that, that offer boat launches, you can pay to launch there. And there's also, if you do research, um, there's a lot of put-ins on the upper bay for kayaks or canoes or stuff like that. Um, you just, you know, and I don't, I don't know if Dennis launched any of those, but I know that there's more than you expect. And, and because of the shape of that area, was it about waking up and seeing the direction of the wind before you made your decision where you're going to launch from? Uh, no, because I, the area I fished, I knew I had, I could find protection. Okay. That anywhere I went. Um, I, 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 that was not a concern for me at all. Um, my concern was whether or not I was going to have enough water and if I was going to be able to find fish. What do you mean by enough water? As in enough area, uh, or like literally enough water? <laughs> uh, literally enough water. Um, <laughs> literally <laughs> enough water. Um, again, I was fishing skinny water, and I, I pretty much stayed in skinny water all day. Um, I did rotate. I did put, uh, the biggest fish I caught was at uh, twenty and a half, and that was actually the first one I put on the board. Um, it was probably six, seven foot of water off the end of a dock. Um, which was a nice surprise. And I, I, I really just want to hit this point home. Why did you choose super skinny water at this time of year? Is it, was it because you were focusing on like a, a spawn kind of deal or was it just because of the weather conditions you were faced with? I was, I, I, I just felt, I just felt based on the conditions that they would be in that skinnier water. And it turned out, I, I got lucky. I, I, did, I found fish in skinny water.
all day. I don't think it's like luck as much as it is like, you know, you did what no one else did, you know, right. and, and and I, I think Brandon Polinick went on BTL a couple of years ago, and this this stuck with me forever. And it was when they asked him, like, is there luck in fishing? And he he sat there for me. He thought about it. I was like, there's no luck in finding them. The luck is when you throw your drop shot down there, the four pounder gets to it before the two pounder. That's the luck. But finding the fish, there's skill. And you had right. the skill to, to, to get on them. Well, and if I can chime in, um, you know, Dennis is being incredibly humble. Um, this this man has a has a record in kayak fishing that, that is uh, pretty pretty significant. Like he he's he's not he's not just ended up. Oh well, I accidentally launched here and caught the five biggest. Like this man's been kayak fishing for a while and he's pretty good at it. So there's there. I'm sure there was some calculation put into that plan. I'm not gonna let him be as humble as he's being right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's me, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is, but I'm just saying. How tight does that place fish? Like everyone talks about the Potomac being a traffic jam, like I-95. But when I've gone up to the upper bay, it's like, that's even worse. It feels like. It is. If you go out on the flats and you're out there fighting with all the boats, but there's so many docks. There's so many little creeks. There's so many little, you know, just little arms off of it. It, I really, I personally think it fish is a lot bigger than, hmm. than the Potomac does in the springtime. Hmm. I think in the summertime, it fishes a lot smaller because you go out there in the summertime and there's, you know, a hundred boats out there on the flats all, you know, throwing at the same patch of grass. Um, whereas the Potomac, you, it, you, I mean, it's, I think the Potomac fish is bigger in the summertime, but the upper base fish is bigger in the springtime. It, is it more of a hard cover deal in the springtime there? Compared to like the Potomac with it's, it seems like the grass just pops in there at like March, late March. I didn't fish on day two cause I woke up with a migraine. So I, I, I drove home. Um, so I don't, I don't want to speculate too much. Um, but the times that I, that I have fished down on the upper bay and have, have been in the springtime mostly. And I find them most often on wood. Um, that's that's what i was gonna say too okay but i'm also fishing in those areas like you're not often go like i i love to fish a chatterbait but i hate fishing grass sounds stupid right um i would prefer to fish wood over grass any any especially in a tournament because i feel more confident that way um and that you know wood could be, even be docks like <laughs> you know there's there's a lot of opportunity down there for both and i honestly think the upper bay could be one doing either in the springtime. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's just anecdotally from my time on, on the upper bay and from having winners on from that in the Potomac, it just seems, again, anecdotally, wood plays more on the upper bay compared to the Potomac. And I don't know, I've just always been curious, like, why that's a thing. Because, again, the flats, you know, everyone knows about the flats. But then the amount of things that have been won off of wood or docks, it's just, it's interesting, like, why that, that flushes out that way. Mm. Dennis, that's what you I have an idea? Yeah. Well, I don't, um, but that was, that was, um, back up a little bit. There was a couple of reasons why I went shallow as well to, to, to further talk about that, you know, what my thought was. Um, we had the bad weather. I knew I had wind coming in and mm -hmm. I knew I had a lot of kayakers who were probably going to be around me as well as boats. Um, that all turned out to be true, you know, so I figured as skinnier I could get, you know, um, you know, the skinnier I could get, the better chances I had of having clean water, you know, to myself. Um, I didn't fish around any, I had no grass around me at all. Hmm. Um, but very little. Um, just in that, around the deeper water that I did fish, uh, which was very little. Um, most of the, most of my stuff came off of wood. Um, you know, like Jake said, um, I've had I've had good experience with fishing that wood, uh, you know, in those areas. Um, it always seems that's where the bigger ones always hang for me, at least. But I wouldn't pass up grass if I find grass. I don't pass it up. When when you're fishing wood versus grass in a tidal situation, is it just a couple of casts and you bounce, or are you just sitting in an area and just rotating through it? Uh, I'll work it pretty hard, but I I do a lot of casting. I I catch nonstop. Um, I have patience, but I don't have patience like some people that I fish with. Um, 
I can't sit and soak a bait for, for very long. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I like to move and keep moving, uh, especially Dennis, during a tournament. <laughs> Dennis, and I, Dennis, Dennis and I share that trait um, because I my patience level is very minute. Um, I, you know, for me, if I come up, so here's the thing, I guess the grass, it depends. If I'm on a giant grass flat, I'll give it more time. But if I find a spot where, you know, there's a couple little patches of grass coming up, um, it's, it's two or three casts through it. And then I'm bouncing. If I, you know, if I feel, you know, getting hung up on some grass and I rip it through there on a couple casts, if they if nothing ate it, I'm leaving, mm-hmm. I'm going somewhere else. Um, I, I don't have the patience to sit there and, and, and soak a jig or soak a Senko or something like that for, you know, hours on the same spot, look, you know, casting at the same spot and waiting for those fish to rotate through. I don't want the smart fish. I want the dumb ones. You know what I mean? No, no. So with all that said, <laughs> what kind of tide were you dealing with then on that day? Uh, was it an outgoing or an incoming Thomas, I, I believe it was a, Thomas. I believe it was an outgoing, but I don't. I don't remember. Um, I think we had an outgoing all day, actually. Um, okay. But don't hold me to that. Um, so it just kind of gets back to that story about like you saying like you were afraid of not having water. So I didn't know if there was like going to be like a ticking clock of like literally you have three hours in the morning to get this done before you're beached. I, I felt that way. Um, I wow. felt that way, and, and I didn't catch fish immediately. Um, I don't know when I caught that 20 and a half. That was a first, I, I missed two good ones uh, right off the bat within Oof. 10 minutes. Um, and, you know, I'm like, oh, well, here's, here's the way my day is going to go. Um, you know, kind of, kind of like my, uh, my Saturday went up on the kind of window. Um, but, um, you know, I just, you know, with persistence and just sticking with the plan, it, it, it worked out. Um, I found that one and then the momentum started to pick up. And uh, I think that's the only one I found on deep. Everything else came shallow on wood. How hard was it to bounce back from that mentally? Those lost fish early in the morning. Those lost fish. Um, I, I've had. I've, I've had. I don't know. I'm pretty good about that. Um, I, I, I know I that's. Part of, <laughs> I know that's part of fish, and I'm not going to be hooting and hollering. Um, you know, I, I might. You know, if I'm having a bad day and it's in the middle of the day and I've lost several of them, I'm, I'm talking to myself because, you know, at that point I've, I've realized I don't know how to fish anymore. <laughs> I might as well just donate my stuff and go find another hobby. Um, but that's not going to happen either. So. It, 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 I just think it always comes down to the decision that we make as we go through your day here and what you can control. And I know Jake and I have talked about this before. It's like if somebody cuts us off, like I'm not the guy that's going to pull out a gun and get in a firefight on the water about it. I can't control the other person. But if I didn't change a hook out or if I don't land a fish, that pisses me off to no end because I feel like that's – I cannot control if somebody else affects me, but I should have control my variables. And if I mess up with fish, I missed one during the Shenandoah River event that I should have had back. I was trying to just, I was trying to mess around with my motor and fish versus like just reposition and fish. And I had too much slack on my line and (laughs) I couldn't sleep for two days because it's like, I should have thought better about that decision. Um, At at, at about noon, like how, how many fish have you caught? Have you limited out at this point? Where were you at? I don't remember. I could probably, I, I don't know. I, I want to say, I don't even remember actually at this point because it's just, there's been some distance. I've fished a couple of, uh, I've already fished three tournaments, I believe since then. <laughs> so you've already cashed multiple checks by that point. <laughs> I have not. I've come close a couple of times, but I have not. <laughs> when did you feel like you had something going on? Um, probably after the second fish. Um, really, I did. Um, again, I, I, I believe that fish came, you know, probably two hours in, I'd already lost two good ones. It took me about two hours. I just kept bumping around and, uh, you know, I hit, I hit certain areas, I don't know, probably a dozen or more times during that day, during that tournament. Um, but just, it just seemed like fish would rotate in, um, how, how? 
How did you know that? I was just curious. Sorry, sorry to interrupt your story, but like you said, like you felt like fish were rotating in. What gave you that gut instinct that they were? Um, I, well, one doc, I, I found one doc that held three fish. I caught three fish and, um, <laughs> you know, and that's probably, I think that's how I finished out my limit on that doc. And then I was able to call out two more. Wow. Um, on, on, you know, in that general area. <laughs> And, and that's the thing I tell newbies, like that's the, that's the, the curse and the enjoyment of tidal bass fishing is they can stack up on some docks and some trees that I just don't think they typically do on lakes. Again, someone will be like, well, I caught 30 fish off of one dock. It's like, I know you can do it sometimes on lakes, but I feel like it's not the norm versus tidal where you can get those for some reason, they just stack there. They do. They do. And, and uh, I believe I caught one fish out of there. I didn't, I fished it pretty good. I didn't catch any more. I left and I may have come back an hour or two later and I was able to catch more out of it. Um, and, and, and the whole time I had an angler probably about 25 yards away from me. Oh, wow. Yeah. We could see each other. Um, he couldn't see that I was catching fish. I kept the quiet, but. So there was, how many anglers did you share the water with all day? Quite a few. Um, uh, between the between the boats and the kayaks, I'd say I had maybe six or seven kayaks, and the boats were probably just as many. No, the mm-hmm. boats would come in and out. Boats would come in and out. Some of the kayaks would come in and out. I had probably four that were consistently working the same area. Wow, that's insane. Mm. When you were rotating through those docks, were you just going with one technique through the rotation or would you hit the dock with multiple techniques and then rotate? Uh, I stuck with what worked. Um, uh, my goal was trying to finish that limit out. Um, I found something that worked and I just stuck with it till I, till I finished that limit out. Now, I, I was throwing out of stuff during the day, but on that particular dock, I, I threw the same thing. There was just something during the day that kind of convinced you that I had to stick with just getting a limit first before swinging for the fence, or is that just generally like your strategy? That's that's my strategy. I I um I won't even look at the leaderboard until I get five fish on the board, um, and strange. that could be. <laughs> I honestly won't. I'm just superstitious about that. Um, I I just believe, I'm, and I don't I don't believe in wasting time. I just want to keep casting until. I get that lemon on board. I don't get that lemon on board. I don't stand a chance. Uh, you know, I'm fishing these anglers I'm fishing against are, are in the top notch. I mean, you slip up and you drop that one fish, and it, it, it could be lights out. No, that that's true, and it's so hard to know when to get cute with it. Um, you know, the Shenandoah tournament. The Shenandoah doesn't fish like the Susquehanna. It doesn't get stacked. It's usually like you get one or two gold good ones per riffle that you're going to get through, and I tried to get too cute when they were just hitting a chatterbait and a swim jig. And I was retarded being like, well, I did catch almost 18 pounds on a glide bait. Clearly that's going to work if I give it the first four hours of the day. And that was not smart. And I finished 12th and I only got to fish for two hours. And that's why I picked up the swim jig and chatterbait. I was like, son of a bitch, if I just did this all day, I would have actually done better. But I kept forcing, I thought the home run because I could get that. Um, and that's interesting where you're like, I'm just going for just batting for a high average versus trying to swing for the fence. Right. Right. My goal, my goal in every tournament I go into is just get that limit first and then start building on that. Cause I'm not doing anything if I don't get a limit. Um, and I've proven that over and over again. Is there a you, moment? You, you, don't win many, you don't win many tournaments with three or four fish. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's tiny. <laughs> You know, the same thing that Dennis was saying, too, about not looking at the leaderboard until you get a limit. Um, I can't think since I've started kayak fishing tournaments and ha- had success in them, like, you know, after probably my first year, I-, I learned real quick that you can't look at the leaderboard and see what other people were catching and help you. Um, if anything, it puts more pressure on you, it puts mm-hmm. more stress on you. And next thing you know, you know, you're looking at the leaderboard after you just lost two and you're like, well, this guy's already got 92 inches. And then mentally you're down, you're 
Take yep. a cl- cliff dive because you you just lost two fish and the leader's got ninety two inches and you've already talked yourself out of winning that tournament. A hundred percent, and that 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 is really so important to kind of keep in mind. Um, how, how much of the day did you decide to fish before you kind of called it? Were you going to take it to the wire or or due to weather or things like that? You decided that I have to get off. No, I fished. I. It, it didn't, the weather doesn't bother me. I'm going to fish it. <laughs> um, you know, if I've got eight hours of fishing, I'm going to fish eight hours um, because you never know. Um, in that particular, on the upper bay, that particular tournament, I had a, I think going into the last hour, I had 55 minutes left in the tournament. I had a 15 inch that I needed to upgrade. Um, and I needed two and a quarter inches. I knew the last time I looked at the board, I needed two and a quarter inches to upgrade that. Uh, you know, to have a chance. And um, I was able to, with 55 minutes left, I was able to, in about six inches of water, I caught a 17 and three quarter, uh, which gave me an extra half inch, um, you know, to put me, you know, to put me over. Um, I didn't know if I was going to hold or not because the board was off, um, but I knew I needed at least, um, you know, two and a quarter inches to, to have a chance. Um, I ended up catching that fish, that same fish. I went up into a creek, come back out, and I caught that fish two more times before the end of the tournament. Um, and I don't know what it was. It was one Probably of the same, same. It may have been. Um, I, that's probably a good explanation for it. I didn't see a bed, but it probably was. And it was just, yeah. I know, it was sitting on a shallow log. Um, hmm. And I hoped I. I hooked that fish and brought that fish in three times. Wow. Of course, at that point, it, you know, um, it only counts I, I, dropped, <laughs> I, I ended up dropping it the second two times. Um, so it only, because I, I believe I probably could have used it. To, well, actually it wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, you know, because it would have, it would have been the same fish. It would have been disqualified anyway. So, I think I had a 17 inch, so it was my smallest fish at that point. How long did it take you to feel comfortable fishing the upper bay? Uh, for that day? Your life. Um, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I did a lot of fishing after I returned. I was in the service before, and I, after I returned, I started fishing out there from a boat, but I, you know, I'm talking about the flats. Um, I always chased a striper, um, out hmm. there. Um, in a boat. when I got a kayak, I started chasing them a little bit as well. Um, but then the bass took over and I have, you know, my bass fishing conflicts with the striper striper run when they come up in there. So, <laughs> um, sometimes I'm conflicted. I might get out a day or two, uh, during the year, but, um, yeah, it's, I still love chasing the striper, um, but I love chasing the bass even better. Is there anything I can answer? I can answer that question too, Thomas. Go for it. And and you know, it's funny. I'm actually glad you asked that question because the upper bay. The first time I ever went there, I fell in love with it hmm. because I'm like, you're telling me that it's it's moving water and it's large mouth. And they fight just as hard as smallmouth because they're constantly on a treadmill and you can't see anything and they can't see you because the water's typically always dirty. I was like, this is my style of fishing. Give me something loud, obnoxious to throw at these fish to get them to eat it. I fell in love with it the first time I was fishing there. And the next time I went back and skunked and then I went back and I had a great day. And then the next time I went back and skunked, I loved the upper bay from the day I stepped foot on it. But I can also say that there's been times where I've gone down to the upper bay and I've not felt comfortable at all fishing mm-hmm. it because it's just it, completely different. Like it's it's changes so much. And it I think that's it. one of the reasons like the Potomac and the upper bay are so, so awesome fit. Like they're awesome fisheries because they're always changing. But I loved it from day one. Um, the day I stepped foot on it, I was like, this place is really cool. And I knew nothing about it. I just know that I launched in Habit of Grace and I went over to Apartment Cove and just caught fish. So 
It is so freaking interesting. And I've had biologists on to talk about that and, and, and a, a ton of people because it, it's deceptive when you read like the Bass Masters when they go there and it's like, it's 700,000 acres. It's like, that's no, you're talking the whole thing. It's not that big. And and because and, you look at like even when a, when AA went down to Middle River and fished, it, it is a lot. It's just, it is big, but it's deceptively small, if that makes sense, because you have so many creeks you can make a three hour run to, but if you just limited it to just the bowl, it, it's insane the type of fishery that it is and how it can still dish them out with what's available for people. Um, because you mentioned the striper, like there is that saltwater intrusion. I don't know how far that comes up, but I, I, I would assume the fish that are dumped in the Northeast, they're not going back to the sassafras. They're not swimming down there, I'm assuming. Uh, I, would, I would like to see biologist reports on that. I think the tide movement has a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, because I, there's no way to explain why the sassafras is constantly reloading with giant fish if they're not that's true making their way back are there boat uh, tournaments that go launch out of the sassafras uh, i think it's one one river up i want to say in the elk i think there's a large boat ramp there okay um so that could be the you know the reason why some of the fish get moved but um I mean, I think those fish migrate further than people expect. I, I, I can I tell you too. that the, the fish here in the Susquehanna migrate way more than, than people expect them to. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would like to see some biologists like some tag some fish and just track their movement for a year and see how far they actually move. I think we would all be very surprised. Yeah, I, I agree with that because that's the one thing when I've been on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland, we, we've talked about this. Places like the Potomac and the Upper Bay are more sensitive to boat tournaments because if you have a saltwater intrusion, and the classic example is Nanjimoy. Nanjimoy was stocked, and there were there were Thursday nighters that used to go out of there back in the t early 2000s. That's why Skeet Reese won out of there. Dean Renohaus did well. But then they stopped stocking, and then the Thursday nighters stopped. And now you've never heard about Nanjimoy anymore because I think that there's probably saltwater intrusion that pushes up far enough where they can't get back there. And... If you have that saltwater thing that happens on the bay and you have a lot of tournaments pulling crap up just to northeast, it's like a Matta Woman situation compared to maybe a, a Lake Norman or, you know, name your big time lake. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we so where I'm at, we obviously we don't have the issue of yeah. fish getting restocked because you're not allowed to live well fish up here. But, um, you know, I think the upper bay has at least four boat ramps that big tournaments go out of. And, you know, two of them are on one side. Well, I guess technically you could say five tournament boat, boat ramps. Um, one's a little bit further south down in the gunpowder. But, you know, Perry Point and Habit de Grace both have tournaments often. Northeast obviously has a lot of tournaments. The Elk has tournaments. So those fish get moved. Um, but, man, there's just some of those creeks that hold fish that, that, you know, there's got to be some migration. There's got to be some migration where those fish are moving to those areas. And I know, like, wintertime, northeast is prolific because of the deeper water. Yeah. They get a lot of, you know, the wintering fish up there. Um, but, you know, those wintering fish don't stay there. They, they make a trek somewhere. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like, where do they go after that? I know the sassafras, and I don't, I don't want to – like dime out anybody's spot but man the sassafras always has big fish in it mm -hmm. like there's always big fish in that creek i mean there's a lot of places you can go up and down like the northeast you could if you keep going i can't this stupid indian names for these places i wrote some of them down because i knew i was gonna have a problem with my hooked on phonics here um yeah. But the the Chester River, which is not the Indian name, guys. I know you're like Thomas. You said Indian name. And you said Chester. Uh, the Chop Tank or Chop Chopatok Chopatok. I never even say that. Um, like all those. Tank. I think it's Chop Tank. Um, yeah. All those places down there are just are really good. But it's just the run you have to make to get there. Which is lucky in a kayak tournament, you can pick your spots, which is kind of yeah. nice. Um, was it actually this tournament limited just to like the upper portion of the bay, or was it just anything that's considered Chesapeake Bay? Our boundaries. Our southern boundary is the Route 50 bridge, which I highly doubt anybody <laughs> went down there for that. Um, 
honestly, you could probably make the, the southern boundary a lot further up and, and, and you still wouldn't change anything where people were going to fish. But then obviously you have the Conowingo Dam. Um, and then I think there were a couple roads. I want to say the 301 over on the, the Delaware side and maybe 40 on the, on the uh, west side. Right out on the elk. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, the bound, you know, you can launch any public access inside those boundaries with our tournaments. And, and that makes where you're talking about a run, the only run you have to worry about making is to check in mm-hmm. at that point because you got to make sure you get off the water and give yourself enough drive time to get to the check-in location by whatever time you're supposed to be there. It's definitely a pro and con. And I think if you're fishing, what's a lake that pops like mm, Lake Anna Smith Island Lake uh, that pops to mind. You could drive from boat ramp to boat ramp. And so strategically here, it feels like because of traffic and shit, it's like you got to really pick that first spot you're going to launch because it might be hard to kind of uproot, get in the truck and go somewhere else. And that makes it so much more important to practice and kind of know what you're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> so true. When you're looking at the striper run, Dennis, what is the best time to get out there and catch them? Uh, probably, um, well, always spring. Um, they, I think they've put a moratorium or they're starting to restrict it this year just because of the, uh, the fishery itself is starting to, I don't say it's starting, it's, it's been suffering, um, over the last couple of years. Um, really? Yes. Um, so spring, they put some restrictions on it. I didn't chase anything this spring. Um, I generally, if I go out, it's in the fall and I try to get out October, November. And they generally set the season down December 15th. Um, so depending on the weather. And I generally try, I like trolling for them. Um, I've got a good friend of mine uh, that got me into this uh, trolling from the kayak. Um, up up around Port Deposit. Um, I actually dropped in on a, a Harford County side and uh, lapped them and uh, put them at that ramp and then troll out in that general area. Uh, that's where the rocks generally start and they work north up towards the dam. Um, and you can, with a kayak, you can, for the most time, if you've got water in there, you can get pretty far up in there, but you don't really need to. You know, you're trolling around that general area, back and forth between Harford County and Cecil County. Uh, you can pick up some nice striper. Are you seeing any redfish or speckled trout pushing up that far yet? Uh, I have not heard of any. No. Hmm. Boy, if they do, I promise you I will be fishing the upper bay a lot more if redfish start pushing up there. <laughs> they're, they're catching a shit ton of them in the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake. And allegedly, I keep I need to get a guy on the show to talk about this. They're catching tarpon on the eastern shore. There are tarpon sightings. And if that's the case, holy shit. <laughs> that's going to be awesome. You've heard that too. So, yeah, it's a rumor that everyone says they've heard of a person that has seen them, but it's never them. So, I... I we have a we have a guy in our club that lives over on the eastern shore that guides for tarpon. Am I right? Isn't that where he lives, De- uh, Dennis? He is. He does. Yeah. He lives in the Salisbury area. Oh yeah. shit. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna have to pay him a visit. We're gonna have to start talking about this because it's because I have everyone on talking. Um, I've had Mr. Sikorsky on. I've had the guys that run the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay talking about the striped bass apocalypse, but. And I don't like to always just be pessimistic, but the positive is there's more shrimp that they've seen in the bay than ever before. There's more speckled trout and red drum. They're catching sea bass. There's some grouper allegedly down the bridge. And if there's tarpon, like our kids are going to be catching, they're not going to have to go to the Florida Keys. Like they're going to catch all this stuff up here in the yeah. bay, which is pretty cool. True. <clears throat> that is pretty so. cool. But guys, no, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Jake, do you have anybody that you'd like to to say a few words to? Um, yeah, on behalf of MAKBF, um, you know, these these two events, the back-to-back days, they wouldn't have been possible without our sponsors. Um, our title sponsor for the series is, is Delaware Paddle Sports. They've been with us for a number of years. They're the largest retailer in, in the area. They have every kayak brand that you could possibly want. 
they do rigging there in their shop. They are absolutely fantastic and have been a huge supporter of our series for, like I said, a number of years now. Um, so we wouldn't be anything without them. But for this specific event, we had we had partnered with two different uh, sponsors. Visit Harford County had, had sponsored the Conowingo event and Tactical Fishing Company had sponsored the Upper Chesapeake Bay event. But both of their support um, were were truly integral to these events being successful. Um, yourself interviewing all of our winners this year, we a huge shout out to you for stepping up and, and supporting our club this year and giving these guys that put in all this hard work, all this, you know, because they, you know, you get a lot of notoriety. Your your podcast is incredible for what we have here on the on this section of the United States, like. You know, a lot of information gets given out here, and we we appreciate you supporting us as well. Um, our other sponsors, you know, we have the individual events. One, our Newport Vessels is sponsoring our Angler of the Year with a huge uh, package for motor and battery. Um, innovative Sportsmen, Native Watercraft, um, Nature's Best Wildlife Artistries, they paid – they basically got all the checks this year. One of the big checks that Dennis took home was sponsored by them. Um, Boondocks, Suspends, Yak Power, BioNO stepped up hugely this year with a battery. I know we gave a battery away at the Upper Bay, um, 100 amp hour, 12 volt lithium battery. Um, TFO Rods, Fishing Online, Ego Nets, Kayak Cushion, Baits Reels, um, Mex Custom Baits, Old Line Custom Baits, Explore Charles County, and the Juniata River Valley Bu uh, Visitors Bureau. Those are our, our sponsors this year, and our, our club is just ecstatic that we were able to get all those people on board with us this year. So a huge thank you out to them. Awesome stuff, guys. Dennis, Jake, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. If you'd like to go, please support us on Patreon. We're only 10 uh, Patreon supporters away from our next major mm -hmm. milestone. If it really wasn't for you guys, I could not keep the lights on and pump out three to four episodes per week. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. We need to celebrate the fact that you just crossed over 5,000 oh, subscribers yeah. on YouTube. That happened. That don't, happened. Don't just don't just slide on through there without mentioning that you. And that's in how long? Two years. Two years. I mean, Two you're not years. even pretty. I know. I know. I'm not Jeff Little. I'm coming for you, bud. Um, <laughs> but I don't. I don't put out 700 videos a day. So either, which is also impressive. No, I just want to say congratulations on that. That's a big milestone for the YouTube games. So. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um. I lost my train of thought, but thank you. Anyway, like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.